FBI documents, eyewitness interviews, all arrows pointed to this direction. The big question is, did a U-boat cruise into these waters and drop perhaps the most evil person in generations off onto this shore right here? We need to find out. In 2014, an executive order declassified over 700 pages of secret FBI documents, revealing that the U.S. government was investigating Adolf Hitler's whereabouts months and years after he was believed dead. In these files, there are thousands of leads. This is report after report after report. They had an active investigation looking for this guy. Bob Baer, 21-year CIA veteran and one of the most renowned intelligence minds in the world, has reopened a 70-year-old cold case, the death of Adolf Hitler. All the witnesses are damned. There's no fingerprints. There's no decent forensics. It's the biggest mystery of the 20th century. Armed with the newly declassified FBI documents and the most cutting-edge technology, Bob has assembled a team of the most respected experts in the world to execute an international investigation. We are not going to make our conclusions in advance. I just want to do the definitive investigation on Hitler. And for once and all, settle this damn thing. There's not sufficient evidence, in my view, to simply say that Hitler died in the Fuhrer bunker in April 30th, 1945. So I think we just all assumed he died there, but there's no evidence for it. Bob Baer and war crimes investigator John Sensich have determined that Hitler could have faked his death, escaped from his bunker, and landed in a compound in Argentina just three and a half months after being reported dead. This revelation opens a new phase in their investigation. Right now, what we need to do is go back and look at those choke points. Choke points are locations where people who are fleeing the scene of a crime have to make it past in order to succeed. If the suspect didn't get past that area, then the inquiry is shut down there. But the other reason that if any fugitive does encounter these choke points, there will be activity where evidence is generated. We need to really take a look at these two points very closely. Choke point one, how did he get out of Germany? And choke point number two, how he could have entered Argentina. Now, we can't go and piece all of his footsteps together. Not right now. Right now, we need to focus on choke point number one, how he got out of Germany. If you're getting out, you have to thread the needle. The needle is Russian forces. The Red Army is surrounding Berlin. In January 1945, Nazi Germany was on the brink of defeat. Hitler retreated to his bunker in the center of Berlin as the Soviet army began their assault on the Nazi capital. German soldiers battled desperately to hold on to the city, but surrendered on May 2nd, just two days after Hitler was believed to have committed suicide. We need Lenny to keep on looking at the possible routes from the bunker, keep looking, see how he could have possibly gotten out of that city under siege. Lenny DePaul, one of the most skilled manhunters in the world and a former commander of the U.S. Marshal's Fugitive Task Force, continues his investigation in Berlin. When I'm tracking a fugitive, I want to know everything. I want to get inside this fugitive's mind. I want to know what his every thought is. I want to know what his next step's going to be. Choke point right now in Berlin is critical. Could Adolf Hitler have gotten out of Berlin, and how did he do it? All right. Take a seat. This is good. Lenny rejoins Sasha Kyle, an expert on Berlin during World War II. Kyle has access to key documents from Hitler's final days. I mean, if he escaped the Fuhrer bunker, what was his plan to get out of Berlin? Three options. OK. It's boat, train, and plane. OK. Boat, you are on the river, left and right side, controlled by the Russians in this time. Yeah, that Armors. wouldn't work. The next is train. But if you drive out, you are threatened by Allied planes. OK. So that's not an option too, too risky. So the best was proved by 
test pilot, Hannah Reich. Hannah Reich was one of the world's first female test pilots, flying Nazi prototype helicopters in a rocket-powered jet, earning her a place in Hitler's inner circle. On April 28, 1945, Reich flew Robert Ritter von Grimm, the general of the Nazi Air Force, out of the Soviet-controlled city. She completed this daring escape just two days before Hitler was believed to have committed suicide. Wow, that certainly sent a strong message to Hitler that if she could do it, he certainly could. Yes. Can we open this database back up? I want to do a search. Yeah. Sasha's database is the first ever searchable collection of hundreds of hours of interrogations of Hitler's inner circle, conducted by Michael Masmano, a judge at the Nuremberg trials. In a case with no eyewitnesses, this is the next best thing. Throw these words in there. Escape, plans, fly, plane. And cross-reference that with Berlin. Searching. Here we go, we got hits here, look at this. Wow, okay, let's see. Where's Lieutenant Ohm saying? I was deeply convinced that one day I would have to take off in a plane. Hitler and Himmler would be on it. I know about his plans and I know his psychology. It's a good hint to the personality of Hitler. He has bigger plans. Right. And uh, they planned two years to escape before the war was over. Can I see the next one? Yeah. So let's see, the quote is in the conference on 20 April, on his birthday, the Fuhrer did say he agreed to go south. Hmm. On April 20th, 1945, Hitler made his final public appearance, 10 days before he was said to have committed suicide. Can I see the next one? Yeah. All right, let's see, what do we got? Oh, here's a Nazi Admiral Karl von Puttkammer. He says we left Berlin by air in the early morning of 21 of April. That's the day after Hitler's birthday. And I myself left from Berlin stock and others left from Tempelhof. We were about eight or 10 aircraft. April 20th, 1945 was the last day anybody saw Adolf Hitler in public. That was his birthday. April 21st, the day after, there was a mass exodus that flew out of Tempelhof Airport. That's direct evidence that Nazis were escaping Germany at the end of that war. What do we know about these aircraft? Do we have a flight log? Can we get access to a flight log? I can show you. OK. Yeah, let me see. Sasha pulls up flight records from the planes that escaped from Tempelhof Airport on April 21st the day after Hitler was last seen in public. All right, so let's see. They hastily loaded with baggage 16 passengers with five crew. Oh, that's interesting. The first plane was loaded with Hitler's private property. What? Why would Hitler load an airplane with his property if he wasn't going to be on it? He wasn't going to meet up with it later. What do we know about Tempelhof? You see this? Yeah, hold on. That's Temple of Airport. OK, so here's, all right, here's the airport. Where were the Russians on uh, April 21st? This airport was free. 21st, it was not a problem. Every day later, the risk got higher. Yeah, it was higher. In February 1945, Hitler fortified Berlin with rings of anti-tank defenses, a last-ditch effort to hold off advancing Soviet troops. This allowed the Nazis to hold on to the capital city for months rather than weeks. Tempelhof was located within the inner ring of defense, preventing the Soviets from capturing the airport until April 28, 1945. Four days later, the Nazis surrendered Berlin. This Tempelhof airport, can he get there from the Führer bunker? The Führer bunker here? OK. That's Tempelhof airport. And the shortest way is to use a subway tunnel. That is definitely worth taking a look at. If Adolf Hitler was able to make it to Temple Off Airport to board one of those airplanes, specifically on April 21st, he could have been long gone. I need to get to the bottom of that. Lenny's making great progress on the ground. He's determined there was a mass exodus out of Berlin by air on the 21st of April. That was the day after Hitler was last seen. 
Bob Baer, 21-year CIA veteran, and John Sensich, war crimes investigator, review the on-the-ground findings from Berlin, where they are investigating a critical choke point. Could Hitler have escaped Soviet-controlled Germany? The timeline fits. He could have made it out on the 21st. That's very clear to me. I think that's a, a crucial piece of evidence. On the other hand, if we're looking at the second checkpoint, how did he get to Argentina? You look at the miles. We've got thousands and thousands of miles. You can't fly an airplane there directly. There's multiple modes of transportation, multiple stopping points. Take a look at this document. This is a report written by the FBI, the source, who claims to have aided six top Argentine officials in hiding Adolf Hitler upon his landing by submarine in Argentina. It says that the submarines landed along the tip of the Valdez Peninsula along the southern tip of Argentina. We're talking about a U-boat landing here, which that's the way I'd get there. We know in those days you couldn't track them. You go deep enough, go right across the Atlantic. When the Nazis surrendered on May 5, 1945, all U-boats were ordered to report to their nearest ports to surrender. Most captains followed these orders, but 46 U-boats continued to operate in unknown locations. Two of these rogue subs surfaced off the coast of Argentina and surrendered three months later. Here's what we got to do, is we have to establish, first of all, how far a U-boat can go. About 9,000 miles. And that's without refueling? That's correct. How far is it from Europe? It's definitely less maybe around 7,500. I've spent a career hiding people and getting them to escape. I mean, I, I know how it's done. You had U-boats all over the Atlantic, Hitler traveling to Argentina in a U-boat, long range, underwater. That's the way I would do it. I think really the only resolution at this point is that we do send a team to the Valdez Peninsula. We need to determine by review of the area, is this credible? Completely. Famed Nazi hunter Stephen Rombaum, U.S. Army Special Forces Tim Kennedy, and acclaimed investigative journalist Gerard Williams head for the reported location of Hitler's submarine landing in Argentina. What interests me about this is if you want to go to somewhere incredibly far from anything and anybody, this would be the place to come. You know, a place like this seems suitable. Who's going to look here? Who can look here? After driving for hours, the team reaches the tip of the Valdez Peninsula at the precise landing location given in the FBI files. Holy moly, look at this. There's a lighthouse. Observation-wise, this is remarkable the highest point of the Valdez Peninsula. Driving here this morning, I was thinking we'd come to the middle of nowhere. But then you see the lighthouse and you think, maybe, just maybe, there's something in this. This is where the file is sent us to. This is navigation point now that is important for people coming from that place, the big sea. It's old. I mean, this could have been here in 45. I mean, my feeling is, you know, this is such an important navigation point for anything coming down the South Atlantic that there's probably been a lighthouse here of some sorts for a very long time. 1945, they didn't have the sophisticated navigation tools that we have now. So having a point of reference, how easily identifiable is that for a link-up point? Yeah, yeah. Let's do this systematically. The first question is, could a sub have landed here? Tim, you want to investigate the beach a little closer? Absolutely. Thanks. All right, let's go. The team scours the peninsula for any possible U-boat landing sites. I'm looking on the land. There is zero cover. There is nowhere to hide on this peninsula. I look around. I can see for miles. But I feel as if everything can see me. I am just prey. It's a horrible feeling. It's a feeling I despise. I never want to feel like the prey. I want to be the predator. I had rocks falling out from under me. Brutal. 
I wasn't trying to land a special forces unit here. No. Right. Let alone a 56-year-old Hitler. He's 56, yeah. he's not well. <laughs> the other thing is, imagine you land there or you land there, then what do you do? All right, you hump up this hill, and then what do you do? Yeah, well, there's nothing for a long way inland. It's not enough to get here. It's where he can go to from that location. I mean, Adolf Hitler is not John Wayne. He's not getting on a horse and riding off into the sunset. There's no roads. There's no support structure. There's no food. There's no water. Not every FBI report's going to have all the information we need. I, I think we're done here. I think so, too. Yeah? Yeah. OK. We've got to change our approach. We waste a lot of time on the peninsula. Correct. Hitting a whole bunch more potential U-boat landing sites seems kind of ineffective. We need to focus on areas where there are supporters, where there's a potential place of refuge. There's a joke in the investigative community. It's called the black hole method. You never see a black hole, but you see the activity of all the stars around it. We were successful in finding bin Laden that way. The way that we found him was tracking any finances, any contacts, and start narrowing it down. It ended up coming down to just one person. When you're hiding, you can't exist in a bubble. There has to be connections. So you start looking at your known associates. You're like, who in this network of people could support a person existing in a silo? If we're gonna look at who could facilitate um, hiding Hitler from the moment that he lands, so and enabling him to disappear into Argentina, link analysis is probably one of the most efficient ways to do it. Tim uses special military software to perform the link analysis. It scans the hundreds of pages of FBI documents and highlights persons of interest in the area of the Valdez Peninsula based on their frequency of association and their connection to Hitler. The name's gonna be stronger with how many connections that person has with other names. Okay. Hit it. Oh, holy cow, look at okay. this thing go. It's identifying names and connections of everyone in locations, dates, and here are the hot spots. Lausen. Looking back into the FBI files, the German company Lausen is extremely active in the world trade and is considered a most important Nazi spearhead in southern Argentina. After World War II, when the Reich failed, Argentina was the place to come if you wanted to disappear. But you need an organization on the ground. Something like Lausen gives them an infrastructure which they can rely on. They're all party members, and as such, they're all oath-bound to Adolf Hitler. And that means you can make the man disappear. Do you have any locations on Lausen? Does he have anything in this area? So Lausen has properties all over, but most of them seems to be centered in San Antonio Oeste. Here's where we were yesterday, right. Peninsula Valdez. This is San Antonio Oeste. So it's literally just right across the Gulf. Yeah. We need to go to San Antonio Oeste. This is our next target. Rock and roll. Focus is going to be San Antonio Oeste. At the same time, we have Lenny doing his analysis on Berlin. Bob Baer and John Sensich review the findings from both legs of their investigation while the team in Argentina continues to search for a U-boat landing site that could have shuttled Hitler to South America, as reported by the FBI files. What we have to do is to see how would you get out of Tempelhof Airport. They now turn to how Hitler could have escaped Soviet-controlled Berlin in late April 1945. Lenny's making great progress on the ground. He's determined there was a mass exodus out of Berlin by air on the 21st of April. There was a possibility that Hitler escaped from the bunker and made it out of Berlin. It's not conjecture at all that these planes left, because that's, that's a fact. Now what we have to figure out is whether he could have gotten from the bunker to Tempelhof. Let's just keep on strengthening our investigations in both places. In Berlin, Lenny DePaul and Sasha Kyle head underground to retrace the steps Hitler could have taken from his bunker to Tempelhof Airport. 
You see the tunnel? Yeah. And this direction, 400 meters, this is a line to Temple of Airport. So they would have been underground until they reached Temple of Airport. Completely. In 1945, as Soviet troops decimated the city above, the metro system remained untouched. 93 miles of tunnels were converted into a tool of war, allowing Nazi troops to move to nearly every point in the city below the Soviets' feet. Now, it houses the U6 subway line, which follows the identical path to Tempelhof Airport. Today it takes 10 minutes, yeah. and Monday 45, three or four hours. Well, they were up against it in 1945. They had to walk it. This was close to two and a half miles for him to travel by foot on a terrain that was filled with rocks, railroad tracks. Any individual that's on the run, they're going to do whatever it takes to stay out of the line of fire. And that's what Adolf Hitler, I'm sure, was doing. His mindset was escape, escape, escape. He's going to do whatever it takes. This is our station. OK. Lenny and Sasha's two-mile journey comes to an end at the subway's closest point to Tempelhof. What direction is the airport? Look over there. This is the shortest way to the first building. That's quite a distance yeah. between there, about a couple hundred meters. Yeah. He showed me where Tempelhof Airport was. I was shocked. I didn't think it was that big of a distance between the U-6 and the entrance to the airport. I thought when he'd come out of that tunnel, within feet, he was in the front door, but that wasn't the case. You know what I don't believe, Sasha? I mean, as, a, as an investigator, I don't see him coming above ground risking anything. I can't see him being exposed for that long. I mean, do you think Hitler would have traveled the U-6 line all the way here, come above ground, and then run two to 300 meters? It's a risk. He would have had a tunnel built from the airport to the subway system. Once a fugitive pops his head out of anywhere, he becomes extremely vulnerable. In Hitler's case, he's got the Russian army after him all over the place. Desperate people do desperate things, but I don't see him risking that chance of being seen above ground. Better to stay in the underground as long as you can. Well, if there is an underground, do you think there's tunnels here? We found a map that they planned a direct connection. There was a rumor for a connection between Temple of Airport and the U6 line. We never found a clear connection except for one map, but that says it was just planned, never built, as we know. Let's go. Let's walk it. Come on. Lenny and Sasha head to the airport to search for any evidence that the Nazi plans for a tunnel connection ever became reality. I got to find out if there's any underground tunnels that go from the U6 into the front doors of that Temple Off Airport. There's got to be a tunnel. Let's go find out. What's critical here is this name, Lawson, is showing up from these FBI files. There's thousands of names in them, but this is the name that comes up most prominently. Look at that. Bob Baer and John Sensich have mounted a two-pronged investigation into the possibility Hitler may have escaped the bunker and fled to South America. While the investigation in Berlin continues, the field team in Argentina has used a technique called link analysis to uncover a crucial clue, the name of Geraldo Lawson. What do we know about Lawson? The German Lawson company is extremely active in the wool trade and is considered a most important Nazi spearhead in southern Argentina. A spearhead, that's, that's a cover company. We're, we're basically talking about a Nazi cover company in Argentina. I mean, look, a wool company, they got trucks, they got infrastructure, they got people working for them, which would be able to cover the landing of Adolf Hitler and relocating him. Hitler, if he had landed in the Valdez Peninsula, would have needed an immediate infrastructure. He would need protection. He would need money. Where there's smoke, there's fire. The FBI report puts us here, Valdez Peninsula. Link analysis puts us in San Antonio Este. What we want to find out is, did Hitler go to San Antonio Este? Are there documents? Is there oral tradition? On paper, Lawson is exactly what Hitler or any other high-ranking Nazi would have needed. But that's only on paper. 
I say we, we send the team into San Antonio OSD and see if they can cultivate that information into evidence. Yeah, no, I, I agree with you totally. Let's do it. The team arrives in San Antonio Oeste. Gerard Williams digs into local naval archives. Tim Kennedy searches the coast for potential U-boat landing sites. And Stephen Rombaum hits the streets to dig into the Lawson connection. If Hitler came to Argentina, we need to find out if Lawson had enough resources to set something up for him. Let's see if it's even remotely credible. Don't mention the name Hitler. With the help of a local translator, Stephen canvasses the town. He knows of a house okay. which is uh, very near here. They uncover a nearby property once owned by the Lawson family. Ask him, does somebody live here? Vive alguien acá? Parece que no, aunque veo que la puerta. Because he doesn't think anyone lives here, but the new door. Hola. Check this out. This is marble, yeah? This used to be a real mansion, huh? It was probably the most important house in San Antonio Oeste. OK, now we really have to look. I want to knock on a few doors. You know what? Let's try this house. Buenas. Does he know anything about this house? We were told this was the house of Lausen. Lausen, pero por hablar de diferentes tipos de, de actividades, se creó esa casa, se creó esta casa y la otra de las esquinas. Lausen. Pero que ponía el fondo para poder generar esto. And he says the, the middle one there was a bank. Del banco era de Lausen. El banco era el primer banco de nación. No figuraba Lausen como Banco Lausen. It didn't formally belong to the Lausen Comprando. family, but... He was the secret controlling person. OK. Lausen is the central figure. The man had his own bank. This is a guy who could do anything he wanted. If Hitler was smuggled to this area to escape, you need money, you need shelter, you need security. He'd have to have somebody like a louse. Hold on a second. We gotta stop. Who's this guy? No, pardon. No, no, no. Una, una sola cosa. Uh, he's, uh, this gentleman has heard that you're in town looking, you know, for Germans. And usted sabe algo de alemanes acá en la zona al final de la Segunda Guerra Mundial? Sí. Decía que en la en la parte de Puerto el primitivo San Antonio Este. A German submarine? Out of nowhere, an elderly gentleman comes up to us with information about submarine sightings and associations. Who the heck knows what we're going to find? He's the diver. Tony Brochado is okay. the diver. Okay. Sí, sí, and, and he's here in San Antonio. Sí, sí. He lives here in San Antonio. Sí, sí. Okay, so we can find him. He told us about a gentleman by the name of Tony Bruchato. He's an expert on German activity in this general area. Huh. While their local contact reaches out to Tony Bruchato to see if he'll speak with the team, Steve meets up with Gerard, who has uncovered valuable information in the local Navy archives. There's a cluster of submarine sighting from the Coast Guard, from police, all along this coastline. Listen, I just want to get this clear in my mind. Mm -hmm. Germany surrenders, and on May 2nd, Admiral Donitz broadcasts to all the ships at sea, including the U-boats, that's it, we're done, we've lost, we've surrendered, turn yourselves in. And most U-boats do exactly that. OK. But there are 46 U-boats missing at the end of World War II. There's no obvious reason why submarines would be coming to Argentina. It's a long way to come to surrender when they could have surrendered in Portugal or Spain and been closer to their families back in Germany. They had to be on a mission. They had to be doing something. And there's no strategic mission. There's no destructive mission here. But there is the mission to deliver Adolf Hitler safely to friends in the South. 
One file Gerard uncovers in the Argentine Naval Archives lends credence to this theory. And had a look at the files on the Mendoza off the um, San Matthias Gulf. Three months after the end of the war, the Argentine warship, the Mendoza, encountered a mysterious German U-boat operating in these very waters. Three crew members clearly saw a submarine emerge and submerge, and um, it depth charged them. What happened to the sub? They don't know. We have sightings, we have supporters. All of the information that we're receiving, all of the documents, points us to here. If I was a sub-captain looking to infiltrate somebody into Argentina, boy, oh boy, this is certainly prime territory. In Berlin, Lenny DePaul and Sasha Kyle have uncovered eyewitness testimony of a Nazi exodus of planes from Tempelhof Airport the day after Hitler was last seen in public. Yeah, so they could have easily have gotten here in the subway, boom, right to the airport. They have also found that Hitler would have had the underground infrastructure to escape from his bunker and travel within striking distance of the airport. What direction is the airport? Look over there. A 300-yard gap between the subway and the entrance to Tempelhof stands in their way. We found rumors that they planned a direct connection. Lenny and Sasha head into the airport to investigate if this suspected tunnel connection was actually ever built. This is the airport Tempelhof, mm -hmm. and it was completed at 1937 at this time, the second largest building in the world. Wow. It's unbelievably big. When they planned this building, it was planned as a completely independent, isolated complex. Later, when they thought about escape plans for Hitler, it is possible within weeks that they built a tunnel from Tempelhof Airport to the subway station. Hundreds of rooms it was part of Hitler's plannings to let Berlin be the capital of the world. Tempelhof was the key to the Nazis' military strategy and contained an underground factory where planes were built and then flown directly into battle. Tempelhof was one of the final Nazi strongholds and did not fall to the Soviets until April 28, 1945, a week after Hitler was last seen in public. The airport is no longer active, but still houses six stories of tunnels, bunkers, and underground passageways. We're now in the heart of this airport. I want to see the tunnel that's going to take me to the city subway. Sasha, we're coming to a dead end here. This doesn't look good. This doesn't look good. Let's go back down. Hold on a second. Let me get this compass up. We want to be what? North? Northwest is the station. So north, northwest is where the U6 would have stopped, right? Yeah. This way. This is where we gotta go. Wait a minute, what's this? Look at this. That's big enough for somebody to crawl through. It's a small tunnel, but yes, if you go on your knees. On the deepest level of the underground complex, Sasha and Lenny find a suspicious blocked up passage that appears to have once been a tunnel. Give me your GPS for a second. Let me lock these coordinates in. Okay, let's lock it in here. All right, I want to go back up top and see where we are on the street level in relation to the U6 subway train and to see if there's any possibility at all that this tunnel could have led there. Right about here. This is where we were down about 20 feet. This is where it stops. Why would a tunnel stop right here in the middle and of the just park? Just 50 meters away is a train station. Adolf Hitler had a pretty good idea of what he was doing. He didn't wake up Monday morning and say, hey, I think I'm going to try to escape. There's got to be a connection underground to the U-6 subway train.
in the small Argentine port town of San Antonio Oeste. Where is it? Okay. After uncovering an Argentine naval file describing an unknown German U-boat operating in this area, Stephen, Gerard, and their translator make contact with local legend Tony Brochado, who's been diving in these waters for decades. Buenos yeah. dias. Yeah. Can we take 15 minutes of your time? Sí. Gracias. Adelante. Tony Brochado, this is the guy who's going to be able to give us credible, objective information. Does he think that U-boats came to this area? ¿Pensás vos que esos submarinos pueden haber venido? Sí. Does he think that these subs were delivering people, important German people? Sí. What's his evidence of this? Bueno, está de la señora Paisani y desde la cocina pudo divisar la silueta de un de un submarino. From her kitchen window, she saw the submarine in a place called Galeta de los Loros. During the war or after the war? Durante la guerra o después de la guerra? Después de la guerra. After the war. After the war. And what does he think happened to the sub? Once they disembarked the people, uh -huh. they had to leave the submarine somewhere. They had nowhere to go back to. The war was lost. So it was scuttled. Así que lo, lo hundieron ellos. Yeah. Yes. OK. We came to San Antonio de Oeste um, to search for more information about possible landings. What we didn't expect to find is information suggesting that there's possibly a scuttled U-boat off this coast. Has anyone ever made an effort to find this submarine? The first Navy expedition, the first real search for the, for the German U-boat, uh, Tony was part of it, and it was back in 1997. Okay, so he was actually part of the expedition to look for it. Yes. The Argentinian Navy considered it so likely that subs were scuttled in this area that they mounted very expensive expedition. How satisfied is he? with the search that he was involved in. One of the facts is that there never was enough search time. It's because of bad weather. Por el clima, ¿verdad? Sí. Yes. We now have a very specific location near here, a place called Caleta de los Loros, the Cove of the Parrots. I hate to use big words like actionable intelligence, but that's exactly what we have. Do you think Adolf Hitler was on one of these submarines? Sí. So he's satisfied that there were supporters of Hitler in this area who, if he landed on a sub, would have received him and supported him and moved him to a secure location. As if a king had arrived. We may have an opportunity to prove that Hitler could have been transported to Argentina. That is a giant chunk of this investigation. As if a king. We're making good headway on both our choke points. It looks like in Berlin, we're halfway there. OK, Argentina, second choke point. Following a declassified FBI file placing Hitler arriving in Argentina aboard a U-boat, Bob and John ruled out the Valdez Peninsula due to its treacherous coastline and isolation from Nazi supporters. After uncovering Geraldo Lausen, prominent Nazi operating nearby, their U-boat landing investigation has shifted to a new location. What we found so far is a secret bank owned by Lausen in San Antonio. Looks like a front company, a Nazi front company. The Mendoza file, which shows that the Argentine Navy was up there in 45, dropping depth charges. And we have 1997, the Argentine Navy was looking for a scuttled U-boat. I mean, this is really authoritative sources. We have this new area where the information is vectoring. Coleta de los Loros. This is a, a cove that's north of the Valdez Peninsula. What's, what's most interesting for me is it was perfectly possible they brought a U-boat in here, delivered Hitler, and then scuttled the boat off the coast. Let's do the recon yeah. and see what we, can, uh, what we can find. Let's look at it from the air. Right. It, we need a drone. What we need to do is to get a drone, do a reconnaissance, and get some photography of the coastline, 
and see if, if those data take us one or more steps closer to proving that Hitler was on the submarine right there at Colette de los Lodos. I think this is our place. Let's put, let's put some up in the air. Let's do it. The FBI files brought us to this general area. If we find evidence, if something tangible, our theory about Hitler coming here is even that much more possible. Tim is armed with a state-of-the-art self-flying aerial drone that captures tens of thousands of high-resolution overhead images. Once the flight path is completed, the computer software pieces the images together to recreate a 3D model of the landscape that can reveal details mere centimeters in size. I am immediately impressed by this area of the coast. It's, it's protected from all of the weather and wind and swells of, of the big dangerous ocean. This is pretty much the perfect spot if you want to land a U-boat. They could anchor somewhere right out there, and a boat could bring someone the rest of the way to the beach. See what we have here. Yeah, see little spots like this would be ideal. No clear line of sight, easy access. From the survey, we have a few anomalies. What is this? That I'm going to go check out for sure. A perfectly circular black, looks like hole, in the middle of nothingness. Really, really, really curious. I'm going to go check this out, I think. Oh man, I think uh, we got something right here. Holy Hey, whoa, 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 whoa. We got a freaking well in the middle of nowhere. This makes no sense to be here. This is unbelievable. Holy crap. Next on Hunting Hitler. Oh, stop right there, George. What's that? There's definitely something there. 100%. 100%. Adolf Hitler supposedly uh, took off 70 years ago, uh, but right now I feel like I'm right behind him. Let's go find a U-boat. If there's something here, we are absolutely going to find it. We're good to go. All right, let's go. Drop it in first. Something. Oh, uh, there we go. We've got something man-made. No way. Is that a swastika carved on that? You got to be kidding me. There's not sufficient evidence that Hitler died in the bunker on April 30th, 1945. Could Adolf Hitler gotten out of Berlin, and how did he do it? How did he enter Argentina? We're going to look at who could facilitate hiding Hitler.